I welcome you to the City of Lake Forest City Council meeting here on April 5th. And I'm talking real slow. Thank you. You'll see that we are all present. Are there any items from closed session to be reported on? There is no closed session and no report tonight, Mr. Mayor. Great. So we will start tonight with the invocation led by Bishop Tony Smith. Thanks for coming. Our Father in Heaven, we're grateful for this wonderful community uh, in which we live for our neighbors and friends. We're grateful for all those we get to associate with and uplift. Uh, we thank thee at this time as well for the opportunity that we have to live in such a wonderful country where we can uh, be free to express opinions and uh, be, be led and governed by those around us as we have a vote as well in this process. We ask thee to please bless us all tonight with thy spirit that uh, there, uh, there will not be contention here, but uh, working together uh, in in a manner that we will be able to uh, in, improve the community as we all desire to do. We ask you to please help us to be mindful of those in need around us as well, that we can uh, bless them and look for ways that we can all serve one another. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. And that leads us to the Pledge of Allegiance, which is going to be led by Council Member Nick. which leads us to presentations. Agenda item number one, presentation of award from California Parks and Recreation Society submitted by Director of Community Services. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, the sports park has won, this will be the fourth design award. Uh, this one was presented by the California Parks and Recreation Society. Um, parks and Recreation Society is sort of the preeminent professional organization for parks and recreation professionals in California. Um, this award was for the planning award, and it recognizes excellence in design of public park facilities, including high standards in the areas of planning, design, community involvement, operation, and maintenance. So I'd like to present this Excellent. to the City Council, and maybe the Mayor would like to take a photo. Agenda item number two, introduction of new employee, Marie Luna, senior planner, submitted by Director of Development Services. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. Marie, if you'd stand. Uh, we're pleased to welcome Marie Luna to the Development, Service, Development Services Department as our new senior planner. Marie has worked for a variety of planning firms over the past 20 years uh, and local agencies, most recently working as contract staff with the City of Irvine. She holds a degree from Cal State Long Beach in Liberal Arts and a Certificate in Land Use and Development Master Planning from the University of California at Irvine. And Marie has been with us for about a month. She is a pleasure to work with, and we're very happy to have her. Congratulations.
And that leads us to the report from the student liaison, Kaya McCullough, from El Toro High School. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Kaya McCullough here, reporting to you all the awesome things El Toro has been up to. We have some super fun events coming up in the next few weeks, so let's get started. Quickly approaching is our biannual Every 15 Minutes experience, coming April 18th through April 19th. This immersive experience highlights the dangers of teen drinking and drug abuse, as well as the risks of driving under the influence of drugs or alcohol. This event will feature students part of the living dead roaming the campus, as well as an automobile crash caused by a drunk driver. I cannot wait to report to you how this emotional event goes, and I'm excited to experience this event with my classmates. Our spring sports are also performing spectacularly these past few weeks, with softball defeating Woodbridge 6-5 to in the last inning and baseball defeating Cypress in a crushing 9-1 to victory. Not to be outdone, boys lacrosse opened up league defeating San Juan Hills 18-0 to and Laguna Hills 16-0. to Boys volleyball has also had a great start to league with a 3-0 to set win against Elisa Miguel. I cannot wait to report to you more on the progress of these wonderful teams. El Toro's show, The Pajama Game, was a huge success, bringing in huge crowds every night of its production. This all-school musical would not have been possible without the tremendous talent and hard work of the cast and crew, and I'd like to give a big congratulations to the entire production. Finally, El Toro's annual male pageant, Mr. Charger, is returning to Charger Hall next Friday, April 15th at 7 p.m. This year's show features 12 male students, all competing for the ultimate title of Mr. Charger. Tickets are $20 for general admission, and I promise you won't want to miss it. That's all for tonight. Have a great rest of your evening, and as always, go Chargers. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that leads us to the public comment section. This time, any member of the public can address the City Council on items not on the agenda tonight. No action be can, can be taken, and comments are limited to three minutes. You'll see some lights pop up to help you with that. Uh, if you can please complete a request to speak form, and when you have one minute left, the light turns to yellow, and when your time has expired, the light will turn to red, and you will hear a buzzer. Do we have any requests to speak, Madam Clerk? We do. Mr. Gregory Sprague, followed by Eric Gerritsen. Welcome. He, well, that depends. You won't be happy because I'm never easy to get along with. And my subject tonight is this flyer that came in the mail, probably made up by the three crybabies, I call them. And if you remember a year and a half ago when I was here, I had a little comment about Moses coming down off of Mount Sinai. And I told you about Ephesians 5, 15 to 17. Go home and look it up in your Bibles. And you three rebels try to live by that a little better. So my main thing about the rebels are they're just angry. They didn't get any. They think you other three got a free lunch, golf down at the Ritz, Carl, down at the Ritz, but look at it the other way. If you had gone, you may have had a fatal accident. Now that would have been tough. So be thankful you're here and you know, you're doing what you can. Now, the other thing is, well, I'll skip that. I don't want to embarrass you people. So then I have what happened to the rebel, the one that was the one rebel that caused the trouble, should have came to me. I would have taken him over to Cherry and Geronimo, introduced him to Gregorio, and he would have told him, I own a printing company, but I printed the wrong name here, so now I have to gather up all these signs and I'll pay you $3 if you go and collect them for me. That would have saved that person from being arrested and charged with a felony, which he paid mega dollars for to get it reduced to a misdemeanor. Not thinking, come to me, I know all the nasty tricks. And then I have, well, oh, so my last words are, when the meeting's over, 
you six, go and shake hands, say you're sorry, and then remember what Rodney King told you. Can't we all get along? And then maybe the three rebels will take you to Baskin Robbins, you can have a chocolate soda. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Eric Gerritsen, followed by Stephen Wontrobski. Welcome. Hello. Last month we received one of the few phone calls that changed your life immediately. The phone call was from my wife's doctor that she has cancer and has begun to spread quickly. My heart sank, but I immediately realized what I needed to do, and that was research to find out what I could do while the tests were being done. Once again, it comes back to medical marijuana. In fact, there's oils that have extreme success with this particular type of cancer, but they're very hard to get. And since I've been looking for medical marijuana for cancer now, instead of just pain, I've had to deal with misrepresentations, non-tested uh, products, and excessive cost. It's time that we allow a medical marijuana dispensary to be opened in the city of Lake Forest where I can have these products available at a reasonable cost to help fight cancer, not have to look throughout the entire valley to find it. Costa Mesa, Santa Ana are now allowing medical marijuana dispensaries. I have provided the five of you with plenty of documentation, research, and information to open up a dispensary for patients 21 and over with a few exceptions if I meet with the doctor and the families for people younger. But I just don't understand after 20 years, it's been 20 years since we the people in a grassroots effort voted for alternative medicine and that being medical marijuana. 2003, the Senate Bill 420 gave the dispensary system the way to do it. Now we had a problem in this city, but I have provided you with a way to make it work. I'm asking for a variance to all the things that you guys have passed to crush this. It's time that we have a place where when other people find out their loved ones have cancer, especially when it's inoperable, that they're going to be able to go to a place that is going to have something that may give them a chance to survive. Please. Give me the variance I need, and I'll bring jobs and more revenue to the city of Lake Forest. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Stephen Wontrobski, followed by Bob Holtzclaw. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor. and. Uh, other city council members, Stephen Wontrowski from uh, Mission Viejo, and uh, uh, this is a follow-up to a past uh, city council uh, meeting presentation that I made a month or two months ago about the, the sheriff's department uh, contract and the cost associated with that. And I recommended that uh, the Lake Forest uh, city manager contact the California League of Cities and uh, obtain information on what on what other California cities had done to reduce police costs without, and let me em emphasize that, without impacting any public safety, all right? Since Lake Forest is a member of the League, this research, I believe, w would have been supplied at minimal cost back to Lake Forest if anybody on, in the staff would have requested it. Two council members endorsed my idea. However, the city manager objected, saying that basically he had done enough work on looking into cost-saving ideas with the sheriff's department, had a lot of discussions. And then Councilman Robinson also said that enough's enough. We've done enough research on this matter. He said we've also uh, done enough research with the sheriff's department. Now, I'm a former contract negotiator, and I've negotiated contracts over $100 million, all right? And let me tell you this, in this case here with your city, the sheriff's department is the opposition. The opposition. Never forget that, all right? You should be seeking ideas and cost summaries and cost saving ideas from other than the sheriff's department. I don't have any problem with working with them, but you should go beyond them alone. 
Now, the next thing is that, accordingly, I request that the city manager once again go out to the League of Cities and get this information, all right, on cost savings that other cities have implemented. On a separate note, has the council and the residents in this city been aware of the following OCFA matters and the implication behind this? One, the OCA, OCFA and Irvine lost their Court of Appeals case. That's number one. There's major implications on that. Two, OSERIS has stated that your city, as well as all other member cities of the OCFA, will be ultimately liable for the pension costs at OSERS of the OCFA if the OCFA collapses. Next item, Irvine said that if they don't get their money, they're leaving. And the last item is that the former fire chief said, if Irvine leaves, we basically collapse. You need, if you haven't been told about that, you need to investigate these matters and the implications behind everything. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Holtzclaw, followed by Nancy Cagley. Welcome. Welcome. Hello, my name is Bob Holtzclaw, and I uh, just want to uh, comment about some of the uh, literature that's come across during the recall. One right here is just the Lake Forest News, and notice the, the letterhead on it. Uh, a lot of people thought this was pretty ra uh, racist, and we got a lot of uh, signatures just because of it. Next, I got this right here, and it's even kind of a doozy, too. It's uh, Fred M. Whitaker, uh, who's the uh, uh, Republican Party of Orange County, the chairman. Does he think we're a bunch of idiots when he mailed this out? We're, uh, the average voter is a bunch of morons? Uh, le let me uh, uh, just point out one little <coughs> sentence here to prove my point. It says, Democrats have targeted South Orange County this November. They know that uh, recalling three strong Republicans will help Hillary Clinton in California? Give me a break. If you guys were gone tomorrow, it wouldn't even uh, have anything to do with the, the presidential elections. Uh, and, I, and I hope he paid for this himself, because I'd hate to believe that he got donations from the average Republican to pay for this. I've been a Republican all my life. Matter of fact, I downloaded this from my computer. That's Ronald Reagan right there in the middle. That's my brother. And on the other side is me. During that time, Republican Party actually represented the regular residents and everybody in the city and also throughout the United States. Now it looks like it's only big money stuffing as many dollars in your pocket and appointing people that aren't even qualified for jobs. Tomorrow, I'm going to mail this in. I ordered a hundred of them, so anybody else wants one, you can have them. I'm changing my uh, affiliation from Republican to Independent Party because I don't want anything to do with a, with any kind of uh, party that puts out racist things here. And you notice here that the letterhead on both of these are exactly the same. Didn't this guy have any common sense? to figure out he should disguise his uh, mailer a little bit different from the one here that everybody considered racist? Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Nancy Cagley, followed by Josh Fiske. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Nancy Cagley. Um, I say hi to all of you. Um, I wanted to comment on the mayor's policy to push a kinder, gentler society. And I think one of the reasons is because maybe you feel, Mr. Hamilton, Mr. Mayor, that there are some of us in this council meeting that come regularly that maybe don't give due respect. And I wanted to speak to that. And I think that there is a time when people feel like things aren't going right that they should speak up. You have said that you're a member of Saddleback Church. And I have some scripture here. It's from the book of Matthew, chapter one, uh, 21, and it speaks of Christ going into the temple. 
When Jesus entered, let's see, when um, Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there, he overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, and you're making it a den of robbers. There are some analogies here. And when we feel that some of you are not acting in our best interest, we not only have the right, we have the obligation to let you know that you are not representing our best interests. And that makes me a very sad person because I have a high regard for our city. And when I see things going on like rezoning so that, that builders can make more money and take up all of our, our property that's free, it makes me a sad person. And I don't think I should be scolded for speaking up. It is righteous indignation. And when things don't go well, you can guarantee that there are those of us who will speak up. And we will not be admonished as children. Thank you. Thank you for Josh Piscay, followed by Lynette Brown. Welcome. Uh, thank you. On March 31st, uh, Detective Lashover of the Orange County Sheriff's showed me a picture of 55-year-old Cindy Hamilton, a known associate and friend of Scott Voice, hitting Mary Jo Axelrod with a left hook, knocking her unconscious, defenseless to the ground, and in danger of permanent damage such as lost teeth and disfiguration of her face. If Mary Jo was one of your family members, what would you have preferred me to do? In surveys, 80% of Americans conclude that men may use any force necessary when the attacker, the vicious attacker, is female. The White Robinson, on the holy day of Easter, the day of our Lord, you chose to exercise your unhealthy obsession of me, evidenced by your irresponsible, unchristian-like Facebook post in a rush to judgment. Dwight. A real man, number one, does not obsess about another man. Number two, a business professional and civic leader waits to gather all the information before making an informed decision. The police report and video from the store will prove that Dwight Robinson is a liar. The police report and video from the store will prove that Dwight Robinson's remarks about me are not only false, but inflammatory and are nothing but more tender to incite the flame of racial hatred in our community. It follows the pattern of your political consultant, David Ellis, who's copying Lee Atwater, who you have employed to save your council position by smearing anti-Muslim, anti-Islamic hatred in our community with emails and flyers. The Facebook post and videos of Andrew Hamilton focusing on women's breasts and buttocks have given him the reputation in the community of being a degenerate pervert. His videos are far worse than the pictures of Donald Trump that Donald Trump apologized for concerning Heidi Cruz. In closing, as we speak tonight, attorneys are preparing several lawsuits to provide justice for the irresponsibility of the White Robinson and Andrew Hamilton that will result in hundreds of thousands of dollars in civil damages and legal fees for Dwight Robinson, Andrew Hamilton, and Cindy Hamilton, who is 55 years old. Thank you for your comments. Lynette Brown, followed by Randy Johnson. Uh, to the police well, chief, um, I, I'd appreciate if this uh, individual approaches me after the meeting um, that you'd have an officer around. Um, He's made some very threatening remarks toward me on a number of occasions, and I'm just, I'm here basically uh, spending a lot of my time serving my community, and I don't think that I should have to put up with an individual who hit a woman. He admitted it, that he, he hit a woman, and he's trying to justify that. He admitted right. it on video, and everybody can watch it, but he admitted it on, you know on what? video. So, Josh, this is your warning. Okay. So I, my, my only request is that just that individual is kept away from me after the meeting. I'd appreciate that. Okay, that's the second warning. Josh, okay. We will have a 10-minute recess if you have another outburst.
Okay. Lynette Brown. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Council members, and city staff. My name is Le Lynette Brown, representing Priceless Pets. I just wanted to report that the last few weeks, we've been very busy and have been honored to work with Council Member uh, Gardner and Voigt on refining and developing a work scope for animal services. And this, this work scope could be used for the RFP to outsource animal services to a nonprofit group. The fact that the stakeholders have been asked to provide input is very refreshing, and I want to thank you for that. We are looking forward to submitting a proposal on an animal services RFP when and if the time comes. We are so happy that Lake Forest is taking a progressive approach and looking to improve the quality of services for the residents and especially for the homeless animals of Lake Forest. Thank you very much. Thank you. Randy Johnson followed by Jim Reichert. Welcome. Good evening, Council. Randy Johnson from Lake Forest. I realize the main event's not until two weeks from now on the animal care issue, and, uh, but I wanted to uh, stop in tonight to give you some food for thought. I submitted a written correspondence to each of you. You should have received it by this time. And the subject on this is the false and misleading Orange County Animal Care dog license compliance data. As you recall, I stood before you back on November 3rd and I gave you a handout. I gave it to staff and I gave it to the council showing each of you seventh grade math that the Orange County Animal Care was falsifying their information on the dog compliance numbers. We didn't have 51.84% compliance in Lake Forest. We have more like 43%. And this affects not only Lake Forest. This is across the board. I did the numbers on Garden Grove. Garden Grove is currently in negotiations right now with the county on this contract. You know what the variance is with them? It shows on the Orange County Animal Care website they have a compliance rate of 49.40%. Their actual compliance rate, according to the correct population date and using the right uh, numbers in the formula, is 32%. That's a variance of 17%. They didn't even know about it. I called Garden Grove City Government on the phone. I talked to somebody who's knowledgeable about it. They had no idea it was bad data. No idea. Rancho Santa Margarita didn't know it was bad data. Go look at their staff report from their meeting on March 23rd. They actually show this bad data in their staff report on page 3. So the county knows about this because Councilman Gardner received a memo from Steve Franks and from Dr. Jennifer Hawkins admitting, knowing that the population data they were using was outdated, which was giving their compliance rate, it was inflated, okay, for Lake Forest and for all the other cities whose populations increased from 2010 to 2014. Have they changed the data on their website? The answer to that question is a no. They have done nothing. They have not they have not disclosed their error, as far as I know, to the public or to the cities. Nobody knows about it. They have a fiduciary duty to the people they serve to give us correct information, particularly when contract cities are in the process of deciding whether to turn over millions of dollars to Orange County Animal Care for their services in a 10-year contract. And we deserve correct data to make that decision on. And for them to conceal that is absolutely reprehensible. And all of you should call them out on this. Every single one of you. And I want to know why Deborah Rose hasn't done anything about this. She sits on the FOAB board. She's supposed to represent us. She knew this back on November 3rd. Thank you for your comments. Jim Reichert, followed by Kenton Bechner. Welcome. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Jim Riker, longtime Lake Forest resident, and I just have a practical suggestion. Uh, for as long as we've been a city, at every city council meeting, our agendas have always been in the same sequence. We do the consent calendar, we do the public hearings, we do the discussion items for the end of the evening. And the last meeting, we had a whole bunch of people here about animal control, and they stayed very late. And I could see you guys. <laughs> 
are getting pretty tired. You're human beings. And when people get tired late at night, they rush to judgment, they make bad decisions, they get a little testy. That all happened to you that night. It's happened in the past. It's happened to other city council members and other city councils for as long as we've been a city. So my suggestion is, why can't we change the sequence of the agenda? Put the discussion items first, the public hearings first, and then put the consent calendar for later in the evening when those things are routinely approved. That's my suggestion. Maybe there's some legal reason we can't do it, but I think it'd be beneficial to you, and it would certainly be beneficial to the public that shows up in large numbers for animal control, Saddleback Ranch Road, whatever the issue may be. That's my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Kenton Betchner. Well, hello and good evening. Uh, I'm Kenton Betcher. You know who I am. And uh, tonight's is a two-minute uh, public service announcement uh, for uh, the California Parks uh, birthday, which is coming up April 16th on a Saturday. And in the 18 years that they, this is the 18th year that they've been doing it, they ask volunteers for five hours of their time to come and work in a state park. Uh, I happen to be with Crystal Cove, one of their annual volunteers, so I get to tell people where the restrooms are, and they give us a name tag, so we, in our five hours we don't forget who we are. Uh, but in two weeks, uh, everybody's invited. Uh, you do need to register uh, with the California State Parks to come to Crystal Cove, and uh, you'll be doing landscaping work in the historic uh, cottage area. Uh, you get to play in the dirt uh, right on the ocean. So uh, everybody's welcome. It uh, really promotes volunteerism. Uh, and let me tell you, at the end of the day, you can really see what's been done uh, for the the, uh, the state parks. So I've got a few announcements I can leave. And uh, everybody's invited and welcome, and uh, you just need to make reservations. Thank you. There have been no further requests. All right, that leads us up to the warrant register, agenda item number three. I'll entertain motions. Um, I'll move warrant registry item number three. I'll second. Let's cast your votes. That motion carries unanimously. Which leads us to the consent calendar. All matters listed under this consent calendar are considered routine and will be enacted by one vote. There's no separate discussion unless members of the city council, public, or staff request items be removed. Have there any been? Uh, have there been any requests? We've had no requests. Colleagues, seven. All right. I'll move the remainder. Four Second. through six. Along with eight. And eight. Did you second? Yeah. Okay. Motion and second. Uh, please cast your votes. That motion carries unanimously. Yeah. Which leads us to agenda item seven. Yeah, the question I had on number seven, uh, in that in that report they specified we had a hundred and thirty one desktop PCs. I think that's two PCs for everybody, for all of our staff. And I'm just wondering, what are we doing with so many PCs? Councilman Gardner, if you look at the number of 133 PCs, first of all, that includes our full-time and part-time employees. So there's additional part-time employees that you're probably not considering in that employee count. In addition to that, we opened um, the computer lab at the sports park. So we actually had 31 of our desktop, com desktop computers over at the sports park. So that's how you get the change from February 2015 to what's on the chart today of 48. So about 65% of those additional computers were actually to provide additional services to the community. Okay, thank you. That's all I had. Does that, are the uh, computers that are here for the senior center, is that also 
That's included in that total number. Okay. And is that included in 31 or is that? No, that was just for the sports park. On that. Okay. That's what I thought. Thanks. I'll move the item. Second. All right. Motion second. If you can cast your votes. That motion carries unanimously. Which leads us to agenda item number nine. Agenda item number nine, consideration of the fiscal year 2016-2017 annual action plan for the city's community development block grant submitted by Assistant City Manager. Mayor and members of the council, I'd like to invite our economic development and housing manager, Jessica Gonzalez, up to the podium to provide a brief staff report. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Tonight's item is a continuation of the draft community development block grant expenditure plan approved by the City Council at the March 1, 2016 Council meeting. As a recipient of community development block grant funding, also referred to as CDBG, the City must adopt an annual action plan in which the City uh, is able to outline how it's going to use its annual CDBG grant to meet the, fulfill the housing and community development goals that are adopted in the City's five-year consolidated plan. The expenditure plan approved by the City Council on March 1st really served as the framework for creating the draft action plan that's presented for you tonight. Uh, consequently, the proposed activities and the public service providers recommended for funding are exactly the same as those approved by the Council on March 1st. As mandated by HUD, uh, the City held a 30-day public comment period and provided copies of the draft action plan to the local libraries and also had a copy available at the City Clerk's public counter. During this time period, the city has not received any public comments. Tonight's public hearing is for final approval of your fiscal year 16-17 uh, draft action plan, which will be submitted to HUD by the required deadline of May 15th. Additionally, HUD requires the city develop an analysis of impediments to fair housing choice, also referred to as an AI, which includes analysis, findings, and actions to address impediments to fair housing and which runs concurrent with your five-year consolidated plan. Uh, consistent with our past practice, the city participated in a regional AI, along with 15 other Orange County cities. The AI evaluated um, existing demographic data, past fair housing activity, city-specific mortgage lender data, and housing and land use policies throughout the region. In addition to the extensive data, the 10-month process included uh, public input through public workshops, informational materials mailed to fair housing providers and the community at large, and multilingual surveys that were posted on the various participating cities' websites. The regional recommendations in the draft AI uh, include to continue doing outreach to the community to make sure that they're well educated on fair housing practices. Now the city, as part of its CDBG program, we provide CDBG funding to the Fair Housing Council of Orange County. They serve as our fair housing provider. And in doing so, they are actively conducting outreach educational campaigns to the community to make sure they are aware of fair housing practices and to also address fair housing disputes. So in the next cycle and continuing with this practice, staff will continue to work with the Fair Housing Council of Orange County to ensure that they are augmenting their efforts of uh, public outreach and disseminating this fair housing information to the community at large. The draft action plan and the AI were both available during the 30-day public comment period that ran from March 4th through April 4th. Um, both comments, when approved, will also be posted on the city's website and will be available in hard copy format at the city clerk's counter. Uh, subject to any comments or feedback, staff will submit the draft action plan to HUD by the required deadline of May 15th. Thank you. So I'd like to open the public hearing. Do we have any members of the public who wish to speak? We do. Sarah Bermwald, followed by Margie Wakem. Welcome. Good evening. This is my first visit to Lake Forest City Council. I have to say you guys are very exciting here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm from San Juan Capistrano, though, so I know a little bit about that. Um, my name is Sarah Bummerwald. I'm here on behalf of Human Options. We are one of the recipients of the CDBG grant. 
um, and have been for a few years now. We operate domestic violence services throughout the county, but specifically in South Orange County Family Resource Center located in Lake Forest. Um, I have been involved with Human Options for the past two and a half years, and as a South County native, I can tell you that this Family Resource Center is very important to us here. The clients who are receiving services at this resource center often have no mode of transportation other than the bus, so they are limited in receiving services in the immediate area within Lake Forest. For that reason, providing legal advocacy, counseling, and group services at this site is very important to us. Lake Forest receives hundreds of domestic violence calls every year, and we want to make sure that these clients are able to get their needs met. Um, the proposed budget for the 2016-2017 fiscal year does propose that you reduce the amount for human options down to zero, and I would implore you to reconsider that amount. Um, this past year we received $10,000, and I believe part of the reason for the adjustment was that as of the first six months of the fiscal year, we had not serviced any Lake Forest clients at that site. However, in the past month, we have serviced four clients, um, and the goal for the year was simply 12. So we are confident that we will meet our goal for this current fiscal year, um, and I would ask you to reconsider that amount for the next fiscal year. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you for uh, what you do. Margie Wakeham. Welcome. I'm Margie Wakeham. I'm the Executive Director at Families Forward. And um, I didn't come specifically to address uh, CDBG, but to thank you for your support. And to give you a little bit of an update on um, the partnership we have with the city uh, in the fourplex affordable housing complex um, uh, on Saguaro. Um, just want to tell you that we were home for the holidays. All four families uh, were moved in uh, with the Christmas tree uh, and decorations. And I want to thank Scott Voigt for being there to uh, welcome the families. It was a very emotional tribute to, um, I think, the work that we are doing and the need for affordable housing. Uh, for the families that were involved, that each one um, uh, comes with such a depth of need uh, and yet a true spirit to get back on their feet and to be productive members of the community and uh, we have seen nothing but progress with all four families so um, I just want to thank you for that support and hope that we can do it again. Um, I also want to let you know about um, a couple of programs that Families Forward has uh, that are newer uh, to our food pantry, our rapid rehousing program for homeless families. Um, we have a counseling program that started um, about a year and a half ago. We've received a number of referrals from uh, the schools in Lake Forest, uh, as well as from community members that just come generally to um, resolve some short-term crisis. Uh, that they are experiencing. Uh, this, um, uh, while there is a crisis bringing them to us, it is very much a prevention of further problems, and particularly when it comes to kids, uh, it really um, staves off those traumas to children. And then I wanted to mention a community resource fair where families uh, and individuals can get direct services will be on April 29th. It'll be at Irvine Valley College and it's accessible by bus, and um, it's a lot of fun, uh, as well as um, uh, pretty rich in services. There'll be 53 nonprofits there to serve the families. So uh, again, thank you very much for what you do. Thanks for what you do in our community, too. So with we, that, we don't have any other speakers. We have no further requests. I will close the public hearing and bring it back to the council for comments and questions. Uh, I, I, I had a question um, for Jessica. Um, um, we took someone off um, our list in. Um, what, what was the amount that we gave them last year? Mayor Pertem, uh, they previously received $5,000. One of the factors that staff takes into account in combination with the CDBG consultant, Mr. Mike Linares, is we look at the three-year performance history. 
And over the past three years, uh, unfortunately, the organization was only able to spend 48% of, of the funds that were awarded. And so these funds cannot be, once they're allocated to an organization during that year, they cannot be designated to another entity. So uh, in a sense, the city uh, loses out on that money that could be used by an organization implementing a resource in the community. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, I, I guess uh, the logical follow-up on that if they only used 48%, why didn't we give them 48%? I mean, why cut them off completely? I'm going to invite Mr. Mike Linares to discuss the three-year performance history. One of the things that the city um, partners with uh, Mr. Linares on is evaluating the quarterly reports, accomplishments, spent funds, and they have had one of the lowest rates in terms of performance as well as one of the highest rates in terms of unspent funds that remain um, unused. Good evening, Mayor, City Welcome. Council. Um, it's always difficult when you make a recommendation for a quality organization to not provide funding, especially one that's been continually funded by a community from year to year. Uh, but as Jessica indicated, we had in, um, been working with non the nonprofits the city has funded for several years now and have told them ahead of time we were going to start taking your performance into consideration, mainly because the funding sources have continued to dwindle from year to year. Um, the funding sources become tighter and tighter, more competition for those dollars. While Human Options is a really good organization, they have performed in terms of their accomplishments. They're hit and miss. Some years they'll hit 100% of their goals. Some years they've been short. The main thing is, again, Jessica has indicated, uh, the agency has left a lot of money on the table that could have been used by other organizations to serve the community. And even up until, this is news to us, we just got the four, you know, fourth quarter reports or third quarter reports are due uh, in a couple of weeks. But as of the last meeting we were here, they had not turned in any, has expended any funds, it had not served anyone in the community. So based on that, we were reviewing the applications and looking at the need and other requests from other organizations. It was a tough decision, but the decision was to recommend to the council not to fund the agency this year or following year. They could always come back, maybe come back with a new program or a new plan on how they can continue to meet the goals in the community. But based on their review, the, um, review of their performance, that, that was staff's recommendation at this time. Okay. I, had a, I had a broader question. And thank you for the answer. And I know you guys do your homework because I talk to some of these agencies to make sure you do your homework, and they tell me that you do. Uh, it seems to me it's the same uh, usual suspects, though. There's about eight or nine people, and every year it's the same eight or nine people. Uh, do we only have eight or nine groups in need? I would think that there are more groups in need, and what are we doing to get it across to more groups that these funds are available? Mayor Council, I'll, I'll speak in general terms, especially with other communities I work with. I work with others in North Orange County, Central and South Orange County. And that is not unusual. Uh, there are uh, several nonprofits that focus in particular geographic areas of the county. Um, so you may not have, uh, for example, a, a, uh, um, a health provider in Fullerton that will apply for funding in this part of the county because simply they don't have the number of residents coming uh, from here up north. So a lot of it is, is established, for lack of a term, turf of the organizations that they work with. Um, school district, you know, the city does fund an after-school program. So again, there's just some natural geographic um, uh, tendencies of the organizations applying for funds. Uh, the city does do a, a notice when funds are available. Um, we, do, we do reach out to the community, but it seems like, you know, it is, as you have seen, very much the same organization apply for year to year. Sometimes we do get new organizations. One of the things that we do is we work with those organizations up front so they understand what the requirements of the grant are. The, as they tell organizations, it does say it's a, it's a block grant, but there's nothing free about this money. There's a lot of responsibility that comes with it, a lot of administration, a lot of oversight. And, um, and there's a, a small window of population that can be served by the, by the funding. 
So we want to make sure that agencies that apply for the funds, we try to educate them up front so that way we don't have situations where money goes unspent uh, when, when it could go to help uh, other residents of the community. Uh, but there is outreach that is done. I'll let Jessica in, um, address that if she wants to, if additional things that the city does do for outreach. There is outreach that is done, but it does tend to be those same organizations, and that is not unusual for this program. Just to follow up on the outreach, Jessica does all these marvelous workshops all the time in economic development. Have we done something like this for, um, for this group where we bring people in and you know, who might be interested and educate them about the process so that more people could become involved? Uh, yes, Councilmember. In combination with the public notices that are sent out in the paper, we also hold informational meetings here. We held one in December with um, all of our existing organizations that we fund and any potential organizations. So we are actively encouraging organizations from throughout Orange County, north and south, to be able to apply for the funding. But what uh, Mr. Lenari shared is very accurate. They tend to focus more on their specific regions because maybe they don't have the vehicles in place to be able to make it out to Lake Forest or vice versa. Residents are not making the commute over to um, their organizations which are located in perhaps northern um, sections. But we are doing active outreach on our website through the paper and through the public informational meetings that we hold here. Uh, on a follow-up while you're still there, um, so we, we reach not only South Orange County, but you're reaching outside of our community to give block grants Correct. to other communities? Correct. We are doing active outreach. All right, and, and do these um, do these not for profits? Are mostly not for profits. Said is that always got to be? Not for, can they only only apply not for profits? They have to meet um, certain criteria, being able to serve, of course, Lake Forest low and moderate income population, and so some of them, most of them, tend to be um, the non profits. So um, children, uh, the elderly, the disabled, are those come into some of the categories. Yes, some of the categories that we have in your proposed um, draft action plan are the school district. We have age well, senior um, services. There are different um, components and different sections that will meet HUD's criteria. And so any organization that falls within any of those categories is able to apply. All right. Thank you. Sure. All right. With that, maybe I'll entertain a motion. I'll move the item. I'll second, and um, <clears throat> I would like to encourage uh, Human Options to uh, apply again next year. And also, just on a personal note, if uh, you wouldn't mind uh, reaching out to our city clerk sometime this week, I'd love to uh, personally uh, be supportive of your organization. I think that you're doing good work, <clears throat> understanding that the impact for Lake Forest residents hasn't been uh, significant during this period, but it looks like it could be moving forward. It, it's possible that next year you could get um, some funding, so I encourage you to, to uh, apply there. Personally, um, my, uh, my interest in supporting you crosses jurisdictional bounds, but uh, with the expenditure of city dollars, um, I just want to make sure that it's spent on uh, where it's going to have the most impact for the city. So, But thank you very much. I appreciate it. And that was my second the motion. All right. If there's no discussion, let's cast our votes. Sorry, I'm going to have you guys register again because for some reason it turned off. That motion carries with Councilmember Nick opposed. Which leads us to discussion action items, agenda item number 10. Uh, Mr. Members of the City Council, I'm going to turn this presentation over to Mr. Tomayino and our Chief, uh, Chief Adams, uh, to do a presentation as it relates to some changing uh, models as it relates to deployment in Lake Forest by the OCFA. So, Mr. Tomayino and Chief, it's yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. City Manager. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Chief Adams. He's with the Orange County Fire Authority. He's prepared uh, a detailed presentation for the council. And as always, if you have any questions, we are, we are here to answer those. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Members of the council and the staff, uh, tonight I am happy to be here to discuss the emergency services de delivery enhancement, uh, particularly as it pertains to the city of Lake Forest. Uh, the first part of OCFA's uh, service delivery enhancements went into effect July 10, 2015. Uh, included in these de uh, delivery enhancements was the creation of four advanced life support engines, otherwise known as paramedic engines, and two paramedic trucks uh, that uh, used to be both basic life support or non-paramedic entities. In phase two, which started February 5th of this year, 2016, uh, it included an additional seven paramedic engines, including Engine 54, which is located in your city here in Foothill Ranch. These changes were implemented to increase the level of service and firefighter safety, decrease response times and the number of responding units, and increase the depth for second call uh, coverage. I have a 20-slide PowerPoint here that I'd like to take you through, and at the end of it, I have be happy to answer any questions should you have any. Okay, as mentioned, the goals uh, were to uh, improve the level of service and firefighter safety, decrease response times and number of responding units, and increase the depth for second call coverage. The Orange County Fire Authority's 80% criteria simply means that 80% of the time we will have the first responding unit on scene uh, in uh, 7 minutes and 20 seconds or less. The, uh, the first ad advanced life support unit or paramedic unit with two paramedics in 10 minutes and our two in and two out uh, that is mandated by OSHA, which simply means there are two people uh, on the outside of a burning structure to rescue the two who are in fighting the fire uh, in nine minutes and 20 seconds. So the first arriving unit in the seven tw uh, minutes and 20 seconds, what that uh, includes is the call processing time, which uh, takes approximately one minute. One minute for the firefighters to get dressed into their bunker turnout gears, which is another one minute and 20 seconds and the average drive time of five, which gives us our seven minutes and 20. Okay. Uh, OCFA engine configurations are, uh, there are three types, and I'll go through each of those with you here. Okay. The first is a basic life support engine. This is what engine 54 was uh, formerly configured as. It was a three-person engine company with uh, uh, no pair. Let me correct myself. Engine 54 was the middle one. A basic life support engine was uh, three persons, no paramedics. Engine 54 was a uh, paramedic assessment engine, or a PAU, uh, three-person engine company, one of whom was a paramedic. And this required a second unit response, as did the first. Go ahead. Lastly, the paramedic engine company is a four-person engine, uh, two of whom are paramedics. The current configuration for engine 54 is number three, as you see on the... Uh, on your screen. Uh, additionally, I need to explain a couple of terms. Uh, a paramedic van is a paramedic van or squad. It, it contains two uh, paramedics, both of whom uh, ride on this rig, and they would be the additional rig that would come into Station 54's area to uh, ensure we have two paramedics to take care of uh, any medical aid call that they would go on. This particular slide shows uh, Foothill Ranch and Fire Station 6, uh, 54 circled there. It also shows the other uh, Battalion 7 houses, uh, 42 in Portola. Tribuco Canyon is Station 18. Station 45 located in Rancho Santa Margarita. And Fire Station 31, which is located in Mission Viejo down by the lake. On the other side of the uh, dividing line between Rancho Santa Margarita, Mission Viejo, and Lake Forest, there you see engine 38 up on uh, the far left, which is in Irvine, and engine 19, which is in Lake Forest. Next, please. Uh, the pre-change configuration, as mentioned, uh, was uh, engine 54, a three-person paramedic unit. The number of calls they ran for 2014 was 1,103 calls. So, because it wasn't a paramedic unit, they relied on the
the surrounding uh, cities to, to, to provide their paramedic service for them. Uh, on the far left there you see Medic 31 which came out of Mission Viejo. 8% uh, of the time they ran into 54's area to ensure they had their paramedic coverage. In the case of Engine 27 down on the bottom in the middle, Engine 54 received help from Engine 27, a, a paramedic engine company, 21% 20, of the time. Finally, over on the far right, Medic 38 received, uh, uh, gave help to Engine 54 26% of the time. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, an example of the makeup of uh, what, the, what the county uh, your immediate area and the protection you got from some of the other areas. This is Battalion 7 and Battalion 4. The, the blue bridge you see are the paramedic uh, companies that are were in place prior to this change. The only, there is an error on this. Uh, Station 45 also had a paramedic as well. Next slide, please. The pre-change regional delivery. Fire Station 31, the Mission Viejo Station, had a BLS engine, no paramedics on it, and a two-person paramedic van. Station 54 was a PAU engine company with three personnel and one paramedic, not enough to uh, meet the county criteria for paramedic coverage. Station 38 had a BLS engine and a two-person paramedic van just like Fire Station 31 had. Uh, you can see the number of calls that each of these units ran in 2014 on the far right. Uh, this particular uh, slide again shows Fire Station 54 and the areas that uh, provide service to help Fire Station 54 meet their medic coverage criteria. It's circled there in the middle. Go ahead. This particular sh slide shows uh, the first due area for Fire Engine uh, 54 in the Foothill Ranch area. Next slide, please. Typically, because they, did, they weren't a paramedic unit, they relied on help from Fire Station 31, which came out of Mission Viejo there, to run in and, and uh, provide the paramedic service for uh, Engine 54. What, when they did that, it left a hole in Fire Station 31's area as they, were, they too were now out without paramedic coverage. Go ahead. This particular slide shows um, that Fire Station 54 in the former configuration was only meeting the service criteria numbers 59% of the time because uh, we were relying on paramedic coverage from either Medic 31 or Medic 38 out of Irvine. Next slide, please. Again. So what we did is we converted um, Medic 31 and decommissioned that particular rig. We took two paramedics off of uh, Medic 31, go ahead, and we put one, again, on Engine 31, so now the engine company that is down at Lake Mission Viejo is a standalone four-person paramedic engine company, again, and we put one person on Fire Engine 54 here in your city and created a standalone single-engine four-person paramedic unit for your city. Next slide, please. Now what you can see is because they have their uh, minimally required number of paramedics, they meet their service numbers 99% of the time. And we rely on no help from any outside entities or other fire stations to get us to this 99% coverage. Go ahead, please. So the new configuration uh, provided with the regional enhancements include a paramedic engine company out of Fire Station 31 in Mission Viejo, the same thing at Fire Station 54 in your city, and again the same thing at Fire Station 38 in Irvine. Next slide. So with these changes, uh, you can see that uh, where there used to be the blue vans in, in the previous slides, there are now four-person engine companies, and what that does is it builds depth in our system, it lets us, it allows us to meet our, our medic coverage in our first due area 99% of the time, and I'm speaking particularly of, of your city alone, and it allows the other cities to do the same uh, for their uh, particular coverage areas. 
that concludes uh, the basic slideshow, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions if you have any. Station on in um, Portola Hills on um, what, what is that? Glen Ranch Road. Is that a paramedic? No, sir. That's a uh, it's a, a PAU unit. PAU paramedic assessment unit. The engineer on that rig is the single paramedic. They require help from uh, one of the other newly created engine companies to ensure they got their medic coverage. And so, w what you did is you um, basically took one paramedic unit and split the crew into two different stations and became engine paramedic units? Yes, sir, that's correct. The one on El Troll Road? That's Fire Station 19. And that's? That remains the same. That was already a four-person paramedic engine company. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, obviously, um, I, I'm sitting here as a living testimony on the good work of the Orange County Fire Authority because um, I actually was um, saved on a construction accident. So thank you for the good work you guys do. You're very welcome, sir. We're happy to do it. Any other questions of staff before we go to public comments? All right. Stephen Wontrowski, followed by Renee Stevenson. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and fellow council members. Stephen Wontrowski, Mission Viejo. Um, I'm against this uh, proposal, and um, people might question why. And uh, it's because you don't need to raise the number of people from three to four. You're providing one extra firefighter, all right? The union loves that. That firefighter's going to get about 240000 bucks. all right? Now, this presentation to the public is really confusing. They don't know what ALS, BLS, paramedic assessment unit, paramedic engine, all that stuff. They have no idea what's going on, all right? So let me give you and the public, in a nutshell, what's going on here. The existing OCFA model, and I've gone to every board of director meeting of the OCFA. I know more about the OCFA than practically anybody else in Orange County, all right? The existing OCFA model is to have, for an ALS call, and forget about what that means, only one paramedic on an engine, and another paramedic on another engine, all right? So two engines have got to respond, plus your ambulance, all right? You've got nine people, basically, in your, uh, in your living room for, to attend to somebody who has an EMS call. This is a very costly and the most common complaint of the OCFA, all right, this model. Costa Mesa, the Triton group study, they rejected the two-unit response model, all right, as being costly and inefficient. The new fire chief immediately saw that this model is terrible, all right, terrible, yet we've been living for it for four years despite all my complaints at the OCFA model, all right? My simple solution, simple, okay, is to have the OCFA to have two paramedics assigned to the same engine, just like is being requested here, instead of one on one engine, one on another. How do you get to just have three? It's simple. You insist that you have a fire captain paramedic on the engine. That's one. You have the paramedic, which is going to be on the engine also, and you got the driver. That's three. You got two paramedics. That's all that's needed to handle an EMS ALS call. You don't need a fourth person. As long as you insist that you want your fire captain to also be a paramedic. And you should do that. And you should also insist that in the present contract being negotiated, that there is a minimum staffing requirement of four members to each one of your engines. And maybe that's the reason why we have this whole thing about four people rather than three. Do not just accept it as a receiving file. Insist that there are only three people required, and we demand, this city demands three. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Could we, ask, Stevenson? could we ask the chief to respond to that, or do you want to wait? I think if we go through all the public uh, comments first, that might be best. Renee Stevenson? Randy Johnson?
Welcome. Good evening again, Council. Randy Johnson. I have to agree with Mr. Rumtrovsky. Um, you know, the woman next door fell down and broke her ankle a couple of years ago. And my wife and I were standing out in our front yard, and we were just amazed. There must have been about 10 firefighters standing out there, one guy tending to her ankle, the others just standing around for a half an hour, you know. And I said, boy, something is really wrong with this system, uh, you know, and, and uh, it needs to get fixed. And, of course, all this is union-driven. We know that. You know, the unions want as many firefighters as they can put on one of these trucks because these guys, and I told you before about this, go to their website. Go to the OCFA website, okay? The average firefighter compensation over $230,000, more than a general practice primary care physician who's got, what, 10 years of higher education and about $500,000 in student debt. And these guys, these firefighters, all they need is a high school degree. And if you don't believe me, go look at their application form. I'm not kidding you. A high school degree, entry level. You can be a high school graduate and you can be a successful firefighter. It's the honest to God truth. And, you know, until we change this with the pension liability and all the huge salaries these folks are getting, you know, and I don't blame the firefighters. They're going to grab as much money as they possibly can. They're no different than the rest of us, okay? The problem is we allow it. That's the problem, is that we allow them these huge salaries and huge pensions, retired 50, 55 with million dollars in pensions. Who else gets that type of stuff? But for holding a hose and spraying water on a house? Come on. I mean, we have to get realistic here. I don't blame the firefighters. I don't. You know, they're just going after as much money as they can possibly get. One thing I want to talk about tonight, though, is this equity plan. Um, Mr. Robinson, you sit on the OCFA board. I haven't heard you talk anything about this equity plan. Irvine's talking about possibly pulling out. Uh, if they do that, it's going to destroy OCFA. We're going to get caught holding the bag. I don't know why you don't come before the people. We hired you to do this. You sit on the board. It's your responsibility to update us and tell us what's going on with that equity plan. This is a very dangerous situation, and don't uh, you know, hang us out to dry here. You need, you need to uh, 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 you know, take some time during council comments or something and let us know what's going on. It's not fair to us you know, if this actually happens and OCFA collapses and we're unaware of it, there's going to be a lot of angry people. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Grady Glover. Good evening, uh, members of the council and Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your time. Um, I came before the council tonight because this is an issue that um, I pay a lot of attention to. I'm a former reserve firefighter here in Lake Forest um, in the late 90s before the program was slowly wound down by the fire authority. And um, I want to say, first of all, I, I am a big supporter uh, generally of increased fire service delivery, whether that's uh, the model that's being proposed here tonight or some other model, I do think it's important that our community has the best fire services that, that, we, can, uh, that we can afford. It's an interesting uh, dilemma that happens when cities like Los Angeles build out and now, you know, arguably downtown LA has a much higher level of fire service and, and even some, are, some of the other parts of Los Angeles just because of how the community has developed over the last 50 or 100 years. As a former reserve, I, I saw the Chief's presentation, and the two things that I think that weren't really covered are what happens when uh, the new engine, Engine 54, or, or not new, but newly configured, um, has to follow up to the hospital. And, and we've got hospitals in South Orange County, but they're adjacent to Mission Viejo Mall and in Laguna Hills, and also the Kaiser facility off the 405. A paramedic engine is required to follow the ambulance on an ALS call to go pick up the two paramedics that rode in the ambulance, and that will take Engine 54 out of that response area for extended periods of time. The other thing that the chief didn't address was that Engine 54 will now basically be the first due paramedic unit for all of the, not Tribuco Canyon, but Santiago Canyon northbound into Majesca. So they have an expanded response area as a paramedic unit, and again, they'll be pulled out of the city uh, to, for extended periods of time, potentially. Last, the current proposal doesn't address uh, the Portola Hills area at all, because 
Uh, we still have a two-unit response required. We've got our paramedic assessment unit, which is excellent. And then Engine 54 will also be coming up the hill, and you'll leave Foothill Ranch exposed for potentially extended periods of time. Um, as a former reserve, I think that that program served the city well, and I think that if we're considering maybe pulling out of the OCFA in the future, having a volunteer program in place ahead of that would really serve the city uh, and, and would give us uh, a lot more flexibility and options uh, if a fiscal crisis were to erupt and everybody pulled out of the OCFA. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We've heard no further requests. So just to ask the chief, is there any additional expenditure on our part uh, changing over to this year? No, sir. As you saw in the presentation, we took the paramedics off of Medic 31 and split them. Uh, we put one additional on Engine 54, which built the current configuration as a paramedic engine. Okay. And you're looking at, at this plan and the results that we've seen since the first week of February. Um, is this improving so far? Have we seen some results yet, even just anecdotal information from the first two months? I'm sure you look at them quarterly. But. We do have some data. And um, what we've seen is, uh, let me just give you some comparative numbers from the, uh, the one month uh, prior. Let's, we'll go from uh, January 4th, 2016 to uh, February 4th. And prior to the change, uh, the engine was dispatched on three fires. After, it was dispatched to two. EMS calls were 76. After, it was 113 calls, which is an increase of 48.68%. Hazardous condition standbys, one after zero. Uh, service calls, eight after seven. Good intent calls, prior, uh, 11, and after the, the change, uh, nine. Uh, good intent, I'm sorry, uh, false alarms, 14 after 16. So uh, the, the total numbers uh, are close, 116 to the pre-change for the pre-change versus 148 after. One of the things I didn't mention is, is we, we built into this program the ability to transport our paramedic, our, one of our paramedics with the uh, care ambulance transport uh, company to whatever uh, uh, hospital the patient wants to go. What that allows us to do and, and provides a benefit to this city, it keeps the engine in the city and allows them to respond to calls and, and take care of the other needs of the city instead of being gone at the hospital. The agreement is, is the um, ambulance company will then bring the, the paramedic back, keeping the engine in service, and if it does get busy, there's a phone call that's made or a dispatch uh, call that gets done, and they meet in the middle and put the, the paramedic back on the rig uh, and, and put them back in service as a full four-person paramedic engine company. The benefit uh, showed itself the other night when the big uh, fire went down uh, at the sushi restaurant in Mission Viejo. Station 54 was available and they, as a PAU, and they, if they were down at a hospital transporting a patient, it never would have occurred. So because they were there, they, get, they got there early and provided uh, safety for our members and uh, helped knock down that fire at the sushi restaurant. Great. Thank you for the response. There were also some questions uh, with respect to a three-person unit versus a four-person unit. Um, my understanding is that a four-person unit is required when there's a fire. There's actually OSHA requirements that there have to be four uh, firefighters that, that show up on scene. Is that correct? The, the, we have a, uh, an OSHA mandate that directs us to provide two in, two out coverage. If you're running a, a three-person paramedic engine company, you don't have, it doesn't allow you to take one paramedic and send them with the ambulance company and the patient down to the hospital. If you do that, you only have two, two people on that engine company and you're out of service. They're of no good to anybody. If you're running a, a four-person paramedic engine company, you show up with your two in and two out and your 
your crew, when you split them, two can go in and, and affect an interior attack on a structure fire. And um, it, what it also does is it, it allows us to uh, provide that additional uh, paramedic coverage uh, that a three-person unit wouldn't allow us. And I, I think the key slide that, that you uh, provided here was uh, all those areas of red where uh, essentially we've been out of compliance. I forget what the exact number was, but something like 59% of the time. And now with this change, uh, the compliance is 99%. And what that means is that you have uh, the right age showing up um, in a quick response time meeting the guidelines. That right? That's correct. Um, some of the results in the first phase have showed us numbers that we never thought we'd see. Uh, for example, we converted uh, fire, fire Engine 30 in um, Dana Point to a paramedic engine company, and we made Truck 49 in Laguna Niguel a f full paramedic truck company. And what that did is it, it slowed the response numbers for Medic 7 and Medic 5 uh, it, it showed us a decrease of, um, hold on, I have the numbers right here, of 2,194 calls just by running a single unit. So the 19% reduction in unit responses due to the single unit is the benefit to all of us. We're no longer paying for that fuel. We're no longer having 10 firefighters standing around. Uh, we're, we're looking out for our environment. Um, I think we're just being, we're trying to, and we're showing we are being more efficient in our model. I, I absolutely agree. Um, the, the reason why I started talking with the assistant chiefs and then former battalion chief uh, Bryce uh, about this issue probably a year and a half ago was I had a lot of residents in Foothill Ranch specifically that were talking to me about the fact that they were using the example that some have brought up where there'd be two OCFA units and then an ambulance that was showing up for something as simple as, as a sprained ankle or wrist or, you know, whatever it might be. Not knowing how serious the issue might be, uh, you know, responding with the, the necessary uh, personnel to be able to treat whatever the issue might, uh, might be at that time. But that seemed like a, a significant uh, response for a lot of people seeing what was going on with one of their neighbors. If they'd seen a heart attack or a, a near drowning or something like that, uh, they wouldn't have the same concern there. But this, this model actually allows us to reduce the number of personnel showing up on scene. And then, again, looking at those, uh, that colored chart that you had, improving the response time in the region as well as providing uh, outside uh, assistance when possible because you're not using uh, those, those units as much as they need to. So... Uh, or as much as they currently are. So, um, you know, I, I think that this is what makes sense. The chief has been pushing it. Um, this is part of the phase two implementation that's already occurred. It's working very well. I think the residents of Foothill Ranch are going to be uh, very pleased just with what's happened over the last couple of months. And uh, I've already talked to a couple of them, um, one being a, a paramedic that works in Laguna Beach who uh, was was uh, acutely aware of what was going on and had been pushing me uh, quite significantly to make sure that I could get us into one of the early phases. So I'm, I'm definitely appreciative of that and uh, would hope that uh, in the future the Portola Hills community could be one of those uh, future phases. I know they don't have as many red areas as Foothill Ranch had, and that's why uh, that particular unit was one of the uh, one of the ones in the essentially the second phase here, one of the first groupings. So I just want to let you know how much I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, I think that we're saving some money, providing better service. Seems like a no-brainer to me. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I just had a few just uh, clarification questions. In your comments, I think, to uh, Councilman Robinson, by the way, thank you for your leadership on this, uh, Councilman Robinson. But you, you said something about... Um, before and after. And I think, were you saying that January 4th to February 4th was the before, and then the next period would be like February 4th to March 4th? Uh, no, sir, I'm sorry, that? and I apologize if I confused you. Uh, the before and after I'm talking about is when Engine 54 was a paramedic assessment unit and not, that's the before, and now it's a four-person paramedic engine company. I gave you some numbers. Uh, that talked about workload and some of the uh, pre-enhancement 
in, uh, implementation numbers. I compared the pre of January and February, that one month, to the one month after the implementation of the change and the creation of the four-person paramedic engine for 54. Okay. And then I think another one, question I had was the, you mentioned something about the Laguna Beach. Uh, it, I can't remember the number. But was what it, you said the calls went up or down? I can't remember. Just could you go over that just a little bit further? Yes, sir. I'd be happy to. So in the first phase, uh, Fire Engine Thirty was a uh, a three person engine. We converted it to a four person paramedic engine. What that did is it 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 allowed them to protect their own dirt, which means they no longer needed another unit to come in and help them create the numbers they needed to be a paramedic in to provide their two paramedics. So now they're running their own calls in their own service area, just like Fire Station 54. We did the same thing with uh, Truck 49, which is in Laguna Niguel. That was already a four-person uh, unit. We just put a second paramedic on that rig to go with the first paramedic, thus giving them two paramedics and two non-paramedics on that rig. By by standing up, bless you, both of those rigs, it took the service calls for both uh, Medic 5 and Medic 7. Medic 5 runs out of Station 5 and in Laguna Niguel, and Medic 7 out of the San Juan, right next to the freeway and um, Ortega Highway. And it took their, their call volume, down, their total unit responses dropped 2,194 in six months. Just providing the one unit and allowing those those rigs to stay back in their own service area, it, it, it what we did is we reduced by 19% uh, the unit responses just due to the single unit response that we created in standing up those two units, Engine 30 and Truck 49. So in essence, the calls coming into the city from surrounding units decreased? The, the calls remain the same, but because we only sent one a, a unit... A double call. Yes. A double, the, the amount of double calls Correct. decreased. Right. Yes. Okay. But then you said the one in Lake Forest went up from 114 to 140, the, something like that. The, the uh, Fire Station 54 engine... Uh, in the pre-enhancement had 76 calls for the month January 4 to February 4 one month later February 5 to March 5 they had 113 calls there is an increase in calls with that certainly so because th these are these are calls now that they're available to take in in an expanded area and where before they would have to get engine or Medic 31 to come in and help them out. There's going to be uh, opportunities where Engine 54 has to go into Mission Viejo to help them out if they're busy, but that's the benefit this city gets by having a regional response uh, or a big fire, a regional fire department like ours. We received the help from Medic 38 and Medic 31 respectively before, and now we're standing on our own and doing it on our own two feet, so to speak. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, it's intriguing, and actually, um, besides the um, two two um, vehicle response that has to come in when you only have a three person um, engine go out, you have one paramedic, and you need two paramedics. And so, obviously, a medic vehicle has to respond. Then you got three paramedics standing there, right? Depending on the configuration, as it was before. Yeah. Uh, when Medic 31 came in, there were three paramedics working on any particular so, emergency medical services call. So um, Medic 31 was split between 54 and what? Uh, the, one, the firefighters off of Medic 31, one went to Engine 31, becoming that person became the fourth person on Engine 31, and one went to Engine 54, becoming the fourth fourth person on engine 54 okay now, now I'm just not only for um, response time and allowing us to get better um, earlier response with paramedics that are on scene um, when needed 
the fact is if there was a structure fire and it was fully engulfed and you got out there and your rig pulled up and someone said there could be children inside, could a firefighter go in with not um, a backup, adequate backup with the two in, two out theory? Absolutely they could. We have a, re a rescue <coughs> exception that's built into that rule that allows us, if we have reason to believe that there is somebody trapped in that house, uh, we can go beyond what two in two and two out mandates and and affect a rescue and try and save the person that is needing our help. Yes. But this actually, because now we have two in two out first response, we actually backs up and saves, uh, makes it safer for the firefighters that are on scene. Absolutely, it does, and it, 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 we meet the letter of the mandate. Great. Well, thank you for your job. Thank you. Yeah, I had a <clears throat> couple of questions. One, a comment. A lot of the data you're reporting here wasn't in the report. I didn't see all these figures and numbers that you're giving. Were they in the report? These, uh, I have a, a worksheet that provided that I got um, that one of our internal folks gave us because it's only been one month. Uh, the, the fire authority uh, said to our fire board that we're going to report back in six months with our numbers and uh, we're confident they're going to be as successful as the, the phase one implementation was. So um, we're prepared to, to... No, no, I'm just saying, would I guess what I'm saying is it would have helped me a lot if in the report we had had those numbers instead of me trying to figure out while you're giving them to us here verbally the next time even yep. if they're tentative yes sir it would be nice to have it in uh, in writing and um, uh, um, you addressed several of the questions that the speakers had I was wondering about the um, the volunteer firefighter uh, why don't we have that anymore in Lake Forest and what's the story behind that well as as we all know uh, Orange County is a big, booming area that, that holds lots and lots of people. We're up to 1.8 million residents now. We protect 580 uh, square miles and 173,000 acres of wildland uh, brush uh, through the state. We run uh, hundreds of thousands of calls. We had a volunteer program, and it benefited us back in the day. Uh, things have changed. Our training criteria has increased. The things that are mandated uh, to us in this business have increased. The folks that manned those uh, rigs in the past had part-time jobs, and the numbers didn't support keeping them uh, as we used to use them. They just couldn't meet our, our criteria numbers uh, and, and make it a, a feasible program. So we diminished the numbers of, of reserve rigs that we had. Additionally, uh, most of most of all these folks on these engines cannot go into a, an IDLH environment, which is immediately dangerous to life and health, uh, because they simply don't have the training. Okay, so uh, OCFA has done away with uh, the volunteer firefighters, or just in some areas they still use them in other cities. We do use them in some areas. Yes. Okay. And how difficult would it be for us to revive that program? I think it would take uh, a, a considerable amount of work to revive it. Uh, I'm not going to tell you it's impossible, but uh, what you would want, sir, is, is you'd want to guarantee that uh, the folks who decided to do that were meeting the mandates that you set down and meeting the needs of your citizens who were sitting behind us here and, and providing uh, something of benefit instead of uh, having a reserve engine not getting out of that uh, apparatus bay when it was called. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. May I? Chief, thank you. I just want to quickly, and this is to you and this is to you and all of your colleagues. I want to express my gratitude myself and on, on and also on behalf of my family, all my loved ones for the heroism you folks show any given day. You never know when that next call comes that puts your life on the line. You folks, your loved ones, your wives, your husbands, you want to find law enforcement in this country, in America, 
is what makes this country, to a great extent, is what makes this country the best country, the best place on earth. You are the true heroes. You and law enforcement. And believe me, I have a good perspective. I know exactly what I'm talking about. I have seen the dark side. I have lived it. I thank you from the, from the bottom of my heart. Very, very sincerely. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I, I truly appreciate the compliment. Thank it you, is sir. very humbling. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Any other council comments? I guess this is a receiving file, so we'll move on to agenda item 11. Agenda item 11, legislative and regulatory matters submitted by city manager. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council, the staff's provided you uh, two bills to consider this time uh, with recommendations uh, as identified. We'd be glad to respond to any questions that the council may have. I'll, I'll make a um, motion that we um, oppose AB 1707 and SB 876. And I'll second. Remind me uh, which one is 1707. One of them is uh, the transparency thing, the public actions, and the other isn't. Which one is the... 1707 is the transparency. Okay. Yeah, I'm. I uh, understand that the the city feels that uh, 1707 is going to give them a little more work. And uh, but I, I believe that those that transparency. So that someone's going to ask for a document and say, "I'm interested in this," and then the city's going to have to say, "Well, you know, you might have been interested in that." Kind of like the way. Uh, Direct TV says, well, if you like that movie, you would like this movie. And uh, I think that's important because people out there who are interested in information don't necessarily know exactly what information they want. They know they want to know something about fire or police or, you know, recreation, but they don't exactly know which document that is. So they're shooting in the dark. They say, well, tell me this or that. So I, I think that would be a better, uh, it would help transparency more by the city saying, you know, I know you asked for this, but maybe those, we're going to give you that, but maybe you'd be interested in that too. I know that puts an extra burden on the city, but I believe that the uh, transparency, not, it's not so much transparency, but the help that would give people requesting information is worth the extra hours um, of staff time to do that. So I object to... Uh, I don't oppose 1707, but I agree on opposing the other one. So we could possibly split it. Uh, yeah, I'd rather split it and then do them one at a time. Okay, I'm I'm supportive of splitting it as well. Um, have we reached out to the the author of the bill? I know we don't currently have a a uh, government affairs consultant that we're working with. We cut that out of the budget, but have we talked to the author of, of that particular bill or his staff? I, I believe we've had some discussion with the league at this point, but not the author directly or the staff. Our, our concern generally, I think we, we, su we definitely support transparency and providing information. That's not a big deal to us. We definitely do. But what's, what's troubling about the bill is that it is very vague. Language is vague. And so you could end up providing uh, some additional tidbits of, of helpful information to someone who's looking for something or reams and reams of and volumes of information that may require uh, just an, an extensive amount of research by the city clerk's office and then essentially creating some kind of unfunded mandate where the state is saying, well, here's what you need to provide, but now provide anything and everything without much specification. That's a little troubling. And in doing so, uh, the league feels, and, and we agree with their position, that it creates potential for, for some potential liability if documents are, are either referenced or inadvertently released that should not have been our protected records, such as health records or attorney-client privilege documents or, or other things, uh, that puts the city potentially in a position of, of weakness if it were to come to litigation. So as drafted, I think the bill is, is far too vague. And in order for this to work, would would require more specific language. Okay. I, I, I don't think... Uh I don't think the city under any circumstances should release things it shouldn't release. But I also agree with you. I thought, too, 
although I'm in favor of the spirit of that, I would have preferred a little more guidance because how would the clerk or anybody else know what's a related item? So that is a problem in the bill. Maybe instead of opposing it, we could ask for it to be rewritten and give more specifications. And, uh, it, it, uh, Councilman, if I could just interject. In, in those instances, you might, for example, request uh, some more specific specificity in, in the bill and say opposed as drafted and, or opposed unless amended. And then in the letter uh, from the mayor and the council, we would identify areas where the bill could potentially be improved in our opinion. Yeah, I have a good idea. Okay, um, so that sounds like a, a good plan. I know that we've done that in the past, so I, I'd be supportive of an oppose and less amended. And then uh, I, I also would be happy to uh, get on a conference call with the, with the author, uh, his chief of staff, and uh, talk about our concerns specifically rather than going through the league. So maybe, uh, you know, we would get on the phone. I do have uh, contact into that particular member's office, so we would be happy to help from that perspective. So uh, with that, I mean, my... I don't know if you want to bifurcate I'm or bi I'm you want to bi bifurcate. And I actually pull that off um, um, uh, for seventeen for seventeen oh seven. I'll, I'll withdraw the motion and um, and ask for um, further information and um, have us um, if we if we can um, reach out to the member. Um. Well, it sounds like there are at least two, and I would go with the two of uh, Councilman Robinson and Councilman Gardner to pose as. Drafted is that the term that you were? I think he said pose unless amended. Yeah, correct. And then add uh, what Councilman Robinson so was I'll kind enough to agree to. So I'll make a substitute motion that we uh, go that direction: oppose unless amended, and then also um, oppose the other bill, uh, SP. Uh, I second that. SB eight seventy six. I second that. All right, motion and second. Cast your votes. That motion carries unanimously. Which leads us to the city manager's report. Well, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council, uh, just a, a, a quick update as it relates to the city's civic center project that, uh, as, as council is aware, we've held a couple of public workshops, uh, and that process is, is going well uh, from staff's perspective and working with our, our consultants who are helping us to bring a, a design in a civic center that uh, the community will be uh, very proud of and, and find great use in. Uh, the, the point I wanted to make for the council and public is that we, we are now in possession of our permit from the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, as council knows, that's taken more than a couple of years to get accomplished, uh, but, but we have received it. Uh, and. Uh, we, we are we are pleased that uh, the, the process now I think will will be a lot more accelerated than it's been because it's been stalled for a couple of years uh, but I think that's good news and I just wanted to share that message with all of you congratulations to us all which leads us to city council comments councilman Garner Okay, uh, I have some uh, forward announcements, forward-looking announcements. Uh, this Saturday, we're having a resource uh, workshop. Um, workshop's probably the wrong idea. Resource fair. Resource fair, resource fair at the sports park, uh, geared toward people with special needs, and that. It's been moved here due to the rain. Oh, is it going to rain on Saturday? Oh, okay. Then uh, you heard the man. Uh, and uh, we've been uh, we've been devoting more and more activities and resources to people with special needs. We have a special needs dance every quarter, and I think this is a great uh, move forward. I'm really looking forward to that. Also on Saturday, not to be missed, is my town hall meeting, which, as everyone knows, who attends that is a marvelous exercise in democracy. That'll be two o'clock at Foothill Ranch, even if it's raining. And then my wife insists I announce that on April 17th, the Seroptimists are having their Luna Fest fundraiser. These are Seroptimists, as you know, are women working for women, and the Luna Fest are films by, for, and about women. And that'll be April 17th. So those are my upcoming announcements. Uh, more importantly, I am uh, really upset by the violence uh, that happened in the city. I 
personally spoke to eyewitnesses. I personally spoke to the police. My understanding is, and until I see the video, it's it's only my understanding, but a, a recall petitioner was attacked uh, by a woman, knocked to the ground, the woman jumped on her. And a man uh, who was disparaged here just recently uh, saved her from further damage. And this is what I understand from the eyewitnesses and the police, but I'll know more uh, later. Uh, I think that was an unfortunate, a, a terrible incident. Fortunately, she's not hurt uh, permanently, although I wouldn't be surprised if that interferes with her recall uh, petitioning. Uh, I think that was an inevitable result of some of the racist and hateful literature that was coming out, some of the intimidation tactics which were directed against recall supporters. But more than anything else, I think it was caused by the inaction of the authorities. Uh, for months I've been talking to the authorities, trying to get them to act in a proactive manner so things like this didn't happen. But in fact, the authorities have been sitting back and letting things happen. And I'm extremely disappointed in that. I'm upset that it happened, but I'm even more worried because I anticipate the recall will be successful, and then that means we're in for three or four more months of the same kind of stuff that's been going on for the last four months. And I believe if the authorities do not change what they're doing, which is almost nothing, then uh, violence is inevitable again. So I would like to ask my colleagues to please uh, endorse having a closed session uh, before our next council meeting in which we talk about what we can do, us five of us personally, but also what we can do to get what I consider to be more proactive and better actions from the authorities so that an incident like this does not happen again during the next four months. Uh, Dr. Gardner, I don't, think, I don't think the state law allows us to hold a closed session on that issue. Because I, would, I would make the issue on performance on staff performance, and I believe if we ask the city attorney, we're entitled to meet on staff performance. Uh, Mr. Mayor, council members, uh, the council can meet to discuss the performance evaluation by the city manager or the city attorney. Um, besides that, there are no other performance evaluations that can be discussed in closed session. Um, otherwise, we can go into closed session for real property negotiations, for litigation. Those, uh, those will not be available to the council here. Right. So well, I, I would consider it as a performance evaluation of the attorney and the city manager. All right. In that case, it is allowable then midstream, uh, and I second that. All right. Any other comments? Can we take a vote on it? You made a motion. I seconded it. I think we're just looking for consensus to okay. do it, and I think is that, two is enough. Is that two is enough? Uh, Mr. Mayor, council members, the, the council policy that was adopted allows for two to have something agendized at a future meeting for further discussion and then for a full vote of the council. So this could potentially go on an agenda for a full discussion by the council, and then that would require a three-person vote. That's what I thought. So, so can, they, can uh, something be agendized for a closed session as was requested? Session? No, no. Just put it on the agenda. The, the request for consensus would put this item on the agenda, which, which would be a discussion whether or not to have um, evaluations uh, go into closed session subsequently. It's a little awkward, but it, it can be done. But the request was for closed session. So would they need to change their item to? Pursuant to the council policy, the only way for this to come back would be for it to come back for discussion in open session to then take it into closed session. By that point, I believe the evaluation of both the manager and the attorney um, will be on the agenda, I think, in May, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, which would be uh, the same time that it would come back into closed session anyway. Yeah, well, and again, I'm not interested in putting it off. I believe the recent violence, I believe we need to work as quickly as we can, so I would like to put it on the next agenda, on the general, if I understand what he's saying, it goes on the general agenda for us to then vote on it for the next closed session, unless somebody wants to join Councilman Nick and I and put it on the next closed session. No, I guess we can't even do that. 
No. Okay. Yeah, we have to. It's a two-step process. First, we put it on the agenda two weeks from tonight, and then we hopefully take a vote. Hopefully, it's a yes vote. It'll be in closed session on, on the first session, during the first session of uh, early May. It's a two-step process. Okay. That's so it. Thank if, you. So I'm only, I, don't, I haven't heard consent to that second request. All right. Well, no, I did second that. I did second that. Okay. That provided the consent. Councilman Nick. All right. Um, I, first and foremost, my thanks to all of you on that side of the podium for being here, uh, including those who had to leave early. Um, my, uh, my thanks my, uh, to, the, to the staff for the great job they do, uh, to my colleagues to my left, um, and in particular, uh, I have m made reference, I have stated actually in, on two occasions that uh, the Orange County Sheriff Department has uh, funded the Nick is Nuts Committee. Uh, it turns out that the organization that has funded the Nick is Nuts Committee uh, to fight the recall, in fact, has not been the Orange County Sheriff Department, has been the Orange County Sheriff Association. Uh, I now understand, thanks to our fine lieutenant, I now understand the two departments are actually distinct and separate. Uh, the Orange County Sheriff Department is the law enforcement arm. The Orange County Sheriff Association is the union. Uh, the two are distinct and separate. Uh, as such, I stand corrected. It is the Orange County Sheriff Association that has funded the Nick is Nuts Committee that's been formed either by or on behalf of my uh, three colleagues to my immediate left. Uh, as such, my uh, apologies. Um, in particular, to our fine Lieutenant Valentine, Sergeant Keller, all those deputies, uh, in, further, uh, in, in furthering my apologies, it really is to all deputies in the Orange County Sheriff Department, in particular those who serve Lake Forest. Thank you, everyone. Again, I apologize, Lieutenant, Sergeant Keller. I wish everybody a great evening and the best in life. Thank you. Councilman Robbins. No comments tonight. Nothing further. I'll end this uh, by saying I saw a few of my colleagues and myself. We all went to the Pet Expo a couple weekends back and also attended the leadership lunch. And those two were two great events for our city. So thanks for staff, all your work, and getting those two events scheduled and Supervisor Bartlett for bringing the Pet Expo to Lake Forest. And with that, we're adjourned. <laughs>